Hi, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN, and the February 18th Cloud 2030 discussion got down in the weeds and started talking about what a successful edge infrastructure would look like uh, in 2030. What would drive it? What would we need to do? What technical things we would need to accomplish? We really stayed on point and focused on this one. And uh, throughout the conversation, we kept coming back to what will drive uh, a distributed infrastructure in the future and how will it look and why we need it and uh, sort of what forces are going to shape it. Fantastic discussion. Please enjoy. Um, we, we all um, know people who are you know babies or near babies right now or five or six years old um, that are going to grow up not knowing how to go to school, not knowing how to do their homework, not knowing how to make a fire, not knowing how to drive a car, not knowing how to buy food, not knowing how to make food unless they have access to YouTube or their smartphone. And uh, when that stuff breaks, I wasn't expecting that to, that to be your 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 okay. additional comment. That's true. You're right. You know, and I'm used to that being the library. That's right. And everything will feed that smartphone. The ability for IoT devices at the store to be working, uh, the ability for your car to be able to talk to other cars. And if that stuff is unavailable, literally everything grinds to a halt. Yep. The day the earth stood still. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, we, we, whether we like it or not, we are setting ourselves up for that kind of problem. Mm -hmm. We think, we think a, um, a, 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 a EMP now would be bad. <laughs> an EMP right. in, in five or six years would, would destroy us. I mean, it would just destroy us. But the, uh, that reminded me of the good old days when digital watches came out and people said, P kids aren't going to be able to read clocks. And it was true. But you also uh, look what, what happened. I don't know how much this happened in Texas, but smart door locks, smart thermostats, all of these things where even if you have a way to do something without connectivity, yep. once the connectivity is gone, it, you can't unlock your door. Right, right. Or, yeah, or, yeah the battery dies or... Yeah. Yep. Easy. Or this is actually what I, what I was hoping we would... So last, last week we talked about um, sort of this inflection point and, and I felt like that was an amazing conversation. I was hoping, and Mark... Thank you for for being being here. The um, the the idea of what would it take to actually build a distributed, a resilient distributed infrastructure. Um, it it would be interesting to talk through what that would look like from that perspective and sort of go through it. Because um, yeah, Rocky, we we the idea that we're building stuff that depends on cloud, you know, data center in the sky. Um, it's a short term. It's a short term solution, right? We it, we we need to figure out how to build things that are locally autonomous. I, well, I, I, that's, I wander uh, through Costco, and every time I go down the aisle that has the light bulbs, I just I see all these smart switches and smart light bulbs, and all of, and I just go past it, going nope, nope, nope. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would, am would a Luddite be, in many ways. <laughs> would you be okay with that if it was, you know, a home system? Like, because everything you're describing to me, I agree with. It's, they're listening to your house. They're, they're you know, feeding data well, back into a centralized data center. The light bulbs me. are just home. I mean, it's just Wi-Fi. And it's on, off, and timers and, sure. and stuff. Um, most of the light bulbs are not uh intelligent intelligentized the way the nest um thermostat was and the same with the uh door locks those are bluetooth or wi-fi too but you no mean, you it's mean they, just... they they wi-fi to something like like a, with a udp socket and then you have to still put a base in your house or yeah. they ring back to the internet somewhere you, you have know? an app yeah, but then again, whoever writes the app, it's up to how they write the app as to whether they get access to all that stuff or not. 
Um, but the the light bulbs just go to your router and whatever app you have on your phone or on your laptop or whatever. And, and I mean, so all, all of that is um, is good from a, a self uh, control and ownership perspective. Um, but uh, of course, if you're still dependent on um, somebody else's power, then none of that matters. It, what, what, um, what we're protecting there against is someone else um, owning you from the outside. And, yep. and like you, Rocky, that, um, that terrifies me. I get asked all the time, oh, you're Mark Teeley. Your house must be um, you know, <laughs> just wired to the, and I'm going, nope, nope, nope. In fact, I had an echo for about five minutes and I threw it out. <laughs> exactly. That's what most, yep. most of the more, the deeper you get into technology, in a lot of cases, the less likely you are to want some of those things. I, that's at least that's been my my yeah. personal experience. My kids love them, um, yep. and they they think it's all the all the rage. Um, <laughs> yep. The the the. I guess let me let me see if this vision I have of of building in ten years makes sense because I I could see especially you look at environmental crises you look at um, you know some digital transformation or things like that. I could I could imagine a house, you know, especially newly constructed house that includes a, you know, basically, you know, the, what we used to have a wiring closet where you would have, you know, a, a, a little grid frame where you could plug in, you know, Raspberry Pi servers or something like that. And, like, you know, a, a, put in a whole bunch of them if you're going to do a lot of a lot of stuff, but you'd have a little three node cluster in your house and it would run, you'd have solar panels, so you'd have a degree of autonomy from the grid. You probably have battery storage, assuming there's some, you know, the battery innovations actually make it. Um, you know, you would you would have, you know, your enough storage that you could store your 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 video YouTube instruction, right? Your your virtual encyclopedia, you know, so you'd have local, you'd have your own um, storage. You know, photos, libraries, things like that, and then I also I also have this vision of that house would have a lot of cameras and a lot of microphones, right? Where you, the house right would watch w watch you walk through it, and you'd be able to interact with it and give it hand gestures, or you'd be able to, you know, it wouldn't just be talking to it. You'd be able to say, "Oh yeah, I'm in you know in this room. I do this motion. You turn on the lights." Or you know, I, I walk into the room and I turn on the lights. Um, is that far fetched? I mean, it doesn't. It feels I, like the, the tech is there. Yeah, no, I think the tech is is already there. In fact, I'm I'm certain if we looked hard enough, we could find examples. Um, uh, I I love the idea though. Um, uh, I think that there's probably a business opportunity somewhere to extend the idea of um, Google Maps offline to like the web light offline for emergencies or something like that, right? So if the if the internet was unavailable, you could still get all of the things that allow you to run your day um, and to solve minor problems, whatever that is. Maybe you could define for yourself what it is. But if you think about, um, well, I, I shouldn't ask you guys to think about it. I, I've done a number of disaster um, avoidance and preparation type plans for companies in the past. And um, one of the things that I always um, found myself having to educate the recipients and participants in the plan from the business on was that the first four or five things you have to solve for are not the ERP system. The first four or five things you have to solve for are those little things that allow you to get to where you need to go. I mean, if you don't have access to a phone book, if you don't have uh, to be able to call your customers mm -hmm. or your partners, if you don't have a communications plan to the people that um, will solve problems on campus or take up work at home, and what work will they take up? Um, a, a simple um, file server that's set up offline outside of the campus that has kind of a, a how-to for keeping the company running. If you don't have those basic things in place, putting the data center back online doesn't do you any good. We did that. I was at HP and we did a disaster uh, trial. I was actually just participating oh. in the trial. And um, we got everything up and running for this very complex system in about 12 hours. 
and and the people in the data center were saying, great, everything's running, everything's great. And all of the customers were saying it's great, but I can't access it. And that was because part of the problem was remote access to that particular data center was affected by the power outage as well. And then lo and behold, solving for that, actually, I don't know if you guys remember, some of you are old enough to remember, uh, Tim particularly is probably old enough to remember. Ouch. Uh, <laughs> it's Rich's birthday, so you can rid him. Oh, that's right. I know. I, I'm waiting for an opportunity yeah. so we can sing happy birthday. All right. Please. We'll do that after this. We'll do that after this. Oh, please. Um, that, but was, my, that, that, that will make my day. All right. It was, <laughs> it was um, early, early 90s, and we lost power in most of California, Oregon, Washington. Yep. You guys remember that? Sure. And, do. um and what was ironic is that the work we did in testing for recovery of remote systems actually protected us because many other parts of, of HP were calling into the data center going, why can't I access? Why can't I access? Why can't I access? And they were saying, but the systems are running, the systems are running. And it was routers at edges and things like that that were down uh, and weren't recovered that were keeping the, the sites from seeing each other. Um, and so it's, it's, it's usually the little things that kill you in a, in a failure. It's not because if, if I, if I can call customers and I can tell them, look, your big order, I'm sorry, it's going to be two days delayed or your payment, it's going to be a week delayed. Fine. We're done. It's over. There's no issue. Nobody is going to argue with that. But if, if customers believe you're a black hole, partners believe you're a black hole, then you're a black hole. So you have to solve for that. And, and I think, you know, to, to uh, it sounded like the point you were making at the very beginning, um, uh, Rob, is that to some degree, we have to figure out how that logic applies to, um, to edge and how much independence um, is required for edge, how much, um, how much of edge building isn't just about latency, isn't just about putting data near the customer, but it's also about giving the customer autonomy when network is down or when somebody else is having a problem. Yeah, there's, there's got to be a, a modes of kind of what we'll call it cellular autonomy. It's, you know, kind of small. It, I've, I've been working fail safe mode. <laughs> well, there's a fail safe mode, but it's, it's actually, it's kind of a, um, a mode where um, there's kind of, nominal maintenance level, you know, kind of, uh, kind of the minimum, the minimum necessary to, to maintain life, if you want to think, think of it that way. This is certainly being done with microgrids and smart grids. And the, uh, mm -hmm. the design there is built around the kind of the notion of, well, the most advanced that I've seen that I'm, I've been working with have been with um, basically a federation of microgrids. They can actually find, you know, they, they bump into one another, they find one another, they can form up and, you know, start to build out an infrastructure based on who's available, who's got the best quality of service access and so forth, and who's both generating power or who's consuming, you know, net consuming power of the in these microgrids and <clears throat> that kind of a of a uh, of a mesh is kind of exactly what was used as the the design principle you know now what 60 years ago when Paul Barron and and Len Kleinrock were starting to talk about uh, packet switching and data switching the, yeah. the notion of you know being able to adjust to the the situation at hand. So I think that what we're talking about is exactly what Mark was Mark was dealing with, which is unless there is a means by which there is a kind of a failover or a fail safe to Rocky's point, um, mode of operating that can be done in a disconnected mode for some length of time, we're going to find all of our systems that are built like this 
you know, like we have right now as being incredibly vulnerable. Back in my first job out of college, uh, the my my boss would uh, we were working on systems stuff, and the 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 term that he always used was graceful degradation, and he used car as an example. All sorts of things fail on cars, but they don't fail dangerously in most instances. And so graceful degradation, how do you get less and still survive? Yeah. Right. Right. And you know, the same right. principles were actually used in the in in the design of uh, some of the best cloud related services. Uh, I think uh, Netflix is probably best known for this uh, the kind of you know designing failure into the whole the whole architecture such that if yeah. there were issues if there were failures um, there was something that continued to be in operation customers still had some modicum of service and uh, you know what Amazon dealt with when they built their own their own failure into uh, into the systems by relying on Kinesis uh, a couple months ago. Yeah. Um, just kind of proves that whole thing out. Yep. But doesn't that require um, something going back to something that Mark was talking about where you have to think about it holistically. You have to think about the end to end process. Like when you're walking through it, I mean, graceful degradation of a data center is, or a system or an application is one thing, but if the failure is somewhere upstream or somewhere connected to that, you may not see it. And so I, I worry about how do you talk about graceful degradation of a service of a, an application or whatnot, but at the same time, understanding the end-to-end connected spectrum of that, right? So that it's not just using Rocky's example, it's not just that, hey, we had graceful degradation of a spark plug, okay, great, but it killed the car. You know, I mean, you know, you how do you how do you work through that? And so for me personally, that mm. one of the things that we always used to do is we used to think about from the end user or whoever was benefiting from that application or that service, we would think from where they are, all of the different components and the ways that they would connect all the way through the application and then beyond it in terms of what it needed to connect to, to be successful and, yeah. and to work appropriately. Uh, what it, and what when it, you start yeah. to map that out, yeah. I'll just say from experience, Number one, most people don't do that because they don't fully understand the importance of it. But number two is it's incredibly complicated. And when you think about doing that within a corporate data center, that's one thing. That's really complicated in its own right. When you start to extrapolate that to what we're looking at with Edge today and the complexity of cloud, it takes on a totally new um degree of complication which is not trivial and so i'm not sure what the answer is there i i understand the points but i also would caution not to sugarcoat it either that this is this is not a trivial issue not at all and, and what it comes down to is the the operative principles in those things has to be observability and discovery and the question is you know which first um observability in all of these things you know kind of transparency is what would have to be required to do the kinds of testing you're talking about tim the problem is and and it is the problem is that uh these systems are generally built in not in lockstep in lockstep not in you know kind of a total holistic manner but they're built piecemeal they're built yeah. built incrementally which means that all of these systems need to have some modicum of discoverability who's out there who am i talking to who's available how can i make myself available or with what and yeah. and that's a 
that's a those are design principles that need to be built into certainly in edge certainly in what, any distributed any distributed system one, of, one of the things that, that that you're describing to me rich that mm -hmm. i think is is undervalued and and i have trouble explaining this as a as an architectural principle but heterogeneity mm -hmm. i i think is undervalued as a design principle and yeah. so right we we have a tendency to you know, really make systems that are designed to work with a very narrow band of, of anything, right? I, I actually have a blog post I'm working on for this about how narrow, this is part of this uh, Jevons paradox, Jevons complexity paradox sequence, but we're compressing releases down more and more and more, right? We're, we're, we're dealing with a customer right now who's, who's trying to scale, you know, 12 year, 12 month old software with a whole bunch of bugs that we know are fixed and they're running into issues that we know are bugs and they're, they're just scaling past a boundary that is fixed in software that they have just the next version up. And the, the challenge you get into is it's incredibly hard to design around an expectation that you're going to have a, a prolonged life cycle for gear that you're going to have different vendors of gear. You're going to have different, different mm -hmm. needs, right? I mean, part of what Mark does, with Edgevana, right, is say, all right, it's, we have all these different providers. We're, we're homogenizing the business interfaces, but you're still going to have different data centers and different, you know, you're still heter heterogeneous under the covers. But I think that's essential. Um, but I, uh, that's, uh, that's my reaction to you. I was, I was going to take a, a slightly different point, Rich, which is spare capacity um, from that perspective. I, one of the things that we do, and this, the Texas grid is a great example of this, is that we believe that we, we can plan things to 90% capacity and we value that. And what I wonder is if to make all the edge stuff work, distributed infrastructure pieces work, we're going to have to accommodate that it's 90, you know, it's, it's only 50% capacity again. Right or or thirty percent like if you're going to design a system that runs system. my house, hmm? the phone system, the yeah. phone system was over designed up until the fact that it, up until the point it got deregulated because it had to deal with the peak capacity and still survive the 90, 95 percent rule. They were required at peak to meet that ninety ninety five percent. For health and human safety. Interestingly yeah. enough, um, uh, I mean, I, I don't, and I don't know where to take this next point. This is more, maybe, maybe this is more just for me than anybody else. But um, on the one hand, uh, I doubt that there's anybody on the call right now who would argue with the benefit we all believe is important to modern technology deployment and adoption, and that is agility, the ability to identify, to test, to deploy and to begin using in production in the shortest possible period of time. And we all benefit from that. Similarly to the idea that we benefit from slave labor driving Ubers and Lyfts around for us um, to be able to get into them. It's built on sand, unfortunately. And the companies that have built the cement for us historically, and to some degree have been sponsored oh, by the on sand. Yeah. They, they are trying to compete with companies that don't have to hold that um, that candle, and um, and that's a hard change. That's a really hard change for them. And the reality is, is it the right change? I think it goes back to what uh, you know Rob brought up in the first place, which is this chain chained complexity model that um, is a real potential problem. And if the phone companies decided overnight to do the same thing that the power companies did in Texas um, and be, oh, we're gonna be Amazon too. We're gonna be uh, uh, Google too. And we're just gonna put the bare minimum requirement for success in every location, you know, too bad if it doesn't work, then where would we be? And so I don't, you know, I don't, again, I don't know what the right answer is. And I don't know that I'm trying to suggest uh, anybody change anything, but that that is an actual uh, com a disadvantage and competitive um, uh, uh, imbalance that exists in many areas of the market. But I, I actually think that, part, you know, and, and the, the, the Texas, the firsthand experience we're having on these, these 
you know chain failures and and lack of lack of sufficient capacity um you know if we get back one of the benefits of of doing a distributed infrastructure model for this is that you can have you know all right i've got you know it's not it in in point solutions it's not that expensive for me to have extra computing capacity in my house that i don't use right um and I mean, I do, I have tons of extra computing capacity. Um, but is it online or is it online of ball quickly? Uh, well, the, the, the thing that I, I here's, here's my dilemma. I feel like we, we really value efficiency and capital efficiency in this case. And like even Amazon is very capital efficient. It's one of the big reasons that you see Amazon as, as valuable is they, they have the illusion of perfect elasticity, but the reality is that they, they they are running at a very high efficiency. And I, I mean, back in the 90s, we, you know, big VMware selling point was you have all these servers, they're not doing anything. It's, you know, 10, five to 10% idle, you know, at active, that's bad, we should bring it up. And we sort of got the idea that we should bring it up to 80% utilization or 90% utilization, um, which then made it very hard for people to get new resources when they were looking for projects, right? And then. Uh, so one of the questions I, I have as I think about this distributed infrastructure is the distributed infrastructure is not going to run at 100% load. The idea is it's going to run at 20% load. And maybe if we're good at doing distributed work, then you could sell that extra capacity for non-essential. The problem is once you start doing that, it becomes essential capacity. Well, um, I mean, what, what networks, what systems do you know actually do run, I mean, at, at anywhere near, you know, whole capacity or, I mean, when you start running at, at full, full tilt, yeah. you want to talk about volatility, you got it in, in spades. I mean, mm -hmm. usually what you're looking at for, for any, any resource, power generation, uh, net, you know, telecom, datacom, um, you know, the, your, your sweetest spot economically is, you know, kind of the, the Pareto, you know, 80, 20, you know, you're shooting sort of somewhere around 75, 80, so yeah. that you have some capacity to deal with volatility and change in, in demand and the ability to, uh, to deal with that. I, I, I can't imagine anybody designing a system that that's, that's meant to operate at, you know, 100% or close to it, uh, you know, in its normal operations. And that um, if anybody actually did that, I, you know, I'd be, I'd be really suspicious of, <laughs> I'd be going after the guy that did the architecture on that one. Well, I mean, interestingly enough, you know, in a, in a data center is not that different, right? In, in supplying sure. power and in each level of power delivery, there's a give back in, mm -hmm. in maximum potential capacity against mm -hmm. what the manufacturer believe is, you know, logical load. And um, the, the only company outside of, um, uh, of that limit that I've seen or almost outside of that limit as an entire offering is Google. And Google runs at somewhere between 70, uh, mid, low 70s to upper 70s percentage on their infrastructure yeah and that's and that is um you know freaking amazing from an efficient too bad they can't sell it as well as microsoft or aws well it's, but still it's an yeah, i mean that's that's the golden that's the golden target Mark. yeah it's that, yeah. exactly it well, when you're talking about millions of machines you don't need very many percentage points to add up to real dollars yeah no it's absolutely right i yeah I, See, and this, this is my dilemma. I, I completely agree with you in, in aggregate. When I look at what we're going to build out with edge infrastructure, we're going to have, you know, a lot of idle overbuilt capacity. And, or, I mean, or we're going to have to figure out, and this is you know, what Mark was saying earlier about this idea of a distributed data center infrastructure where, okay, I'm, you know, I've got all my employees, I ship them a box of, of servers, they plug it in, right? I give them a stipend for the power it's gonna take, power it's gonna take, 
And instead of running all in my own data center, I've actually distributed material parts of my, my compute capacity in all of my employees' houses on the contingency that one, they can stay productive and I've got a way to synchronize it. And that if something happens to any one, then I can, you know, I've now distributed the load. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure that that's practical. I could see it becoming a regional thing where you could say, hey, you know what, we've got employees in Austin and Seattle and California and Boston and you know Minneapolis, and I'm, I'm creating a local data center for those employees, and then those are synchronized. Well, It'll certainly be easier than putting it in everybody's homes. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree. Uh, uh, although I, um, I think that the design idea that you talked about as far as, you know, distributing the load, sharing, being able to share between so that, you know, if you have, if you have five uh, uh, locations in one geographic area, right. the, the general rule would be that under 99% of circumstances, any four of them operating would keep all five customers happy, right? Mm -hmm. Something like that. Um, uh, right. And interestingly enough, the um, uh, what was the point I was going to make about um, oh shit I'll remember it. But the, the, there's a guy I was just talking to from India uh, on the phone this morning who um, from a company called PicoNets who who wants to partner with us. Um, and, and there's a story in there, but I'll come back to it. I'll I'll uh, give up my spot on the panel for the moment. But I think to my the brain. other thing you have to think about here is that we tried to do this with data center capacity, kind of the shared model as, as a means of sharing resources, but also from a redundancy standpoint. And it, it just really hasn't taken off, maybe partly because there hasn't been enough emphasis to do it. But I think there are some real reasons why that becomes problematic. And so when you get to the edge, even further out from the data center itself, do you potentially run into even additional issues? Um, I'm not so sure that, that that's the way to necessarily solve the redundancy issue by pushing it to the edge. Uh, I think you have, to, you have to bring it to some intermediate spot, whether that's the cell tower, whether that's um, something in the middle, but I, I'm not, I'm not certain you can get it all the way to the edge. I think there are just too many variables that come into play when you think about that, especially if you get consumers involved. Is, yeah, is that a, oh, is that a multi-tenant scenario? So, so, and th this to me is a really operative question. If the, the thing about putting it in somebody's house is you're not dealing with multi-tenancy. In the scenario you described, which I actually think is the more likely one, you're all, I'm also ending up assuming multi-tenancy in the infrastructure. Right. And I think that's a very operative to sit, to if, so if, if you make the decision that we're gonna have multi-tenant edge local infrastructure, yeah. then that means that there will be a service provider provide, you know, doing that multi -ten somebody has to deal with the multi-tenancy. Um, right, and we're already seeing that today, right? If, if you look at the technology that Amazon and Verizon have with Wavelength to the edge, yeah. um, you know, to the, to the base of the cell tower, uh, you already have multi-tenancy available at that distance out to the edge. I'm not sure how to, how to right. what the appropriate way to explain it is. But do you have to go farther than that? Well, and Comcast is already doing that. Comcast is using your home connectivity and selling excess to all your neighbors and anyone who drives down the street. Uh, the router that they put in your house is open and any of their customers can actually latch onto it and use that. Yeah. Well, yeah, the wifi, other the broadband router? providers do that too. Yeah. And I don't even think it's an option when you go when you switch from a residential to a business line. I think it's actually forced. I think residential you have an option, but but with business you don't, or with something Comcast, like that. You don't. Comcast oh, wow. even residential does that. Yep. So effectively, every house becomes a cell. Um, a cell becomes a hotspot. Yep. Exactly, and that's how Comcast that's is doing their telephones. Their their cell service uses all the their hot spots in the homes interesting i mean is there is that 
to the extent that you're paying for the access locally, I can see that would be a meh, but as a shared infrastructure story, that makes a ton of sense to me. I think so too. I mean, um, Rob, you and I have had these discussions for hmm. probably the first time we had this discussion was probably four years ago, where <laughs> um, the the idea that, uh, and this, this goes back to the blog that I posted recently on LinkedIn, um, is that, you know, my assumption is that we, we will need too much infrastructure and we will have to deploy it in, in ways that we don't even recognize today. But because the opportunity is so big, it will get deployed and we can not like it. We can say, that's not the way I do it. We can argue about whatever we want, but it will get deployed because the opportunity is too big. And my basic assumption without going into a lot of detail is that one of the solutions for making that deployment work will be this idea that we'll be sharing literally everything, including um, uh, data uh, governance and aggregation uh, and reuse of data to CPU, to memory, yeah. to localized bandwidth, um, to just-in-time compute. Um, because in the long term, the only way that all of the infrastructure that's likely to build for edge is deployable, manageable, and supportable is either that we get to the point where it's all the size of a rice cube or, or, or a piece of rice, or that um, we are effectively um, creating services that allow for shared access to it for both just-in-time work and for rolling issues. Um, that allow it to better leverage the infrastructure that is otherwise there, um, you know, only doing, as we've talked about already, only doing 15% of what it logically could do at any one point in time. That's, I, I like that vision of it. I'm trying to figure out, and it's funny because there's silly things like, and they're not silly, but things like the way we've structured copyright that make it difficult to share, you know, laterally share data. Yep. Uh, I'm thinking back to the old Napster days and there's still, we still have torrent networks and things like that, that should be a great way for Netflix or HBO or something like that to distribute content to people. Well, I, I was we, even, we when I first thought of it with, when I first thought of it with, um, uh, in a conversation it was with Derek Collison. Uh, I was still mm -hmm. at Upsera. It was probably, probably around 2016, uh, early 2017. And I called it multi-tenancy for IOT. But what I'm, I'm, it's not so much that I'm expecting Rob and Mark to both fit on a, 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 a grain-sized IoT device as that many of those solutions, IoT solutions put in place are designed to serve a specific purpose. They're designed to serve the operation of a building. They're designed to serve the operation of a city and all of the things that make that a reality. But the vast majority of that data once it serves the purpose of operating that city, it's not private. It's not, it's not personal. It's just how the city works, how the building works. So there are probably a thousand different varieties of companies and individuals who could gain value from the data output from the majority of IoT solutions that would be across a traditional city, from, from people that manage traffic to people that to, that paint buildings, to people yeah. that manage tr sidewalk traffic, to people that this figure is, out where to put their- exactly what this, Rob, Mark, this is exactly the premise on which um, I co-founded Streetlight Data, and, yeah. you know, almost 10 years ago. Yeah. We gather data from a variety of mechanisms. The most obvious for us were from um, basically snapshots of anonymous mo movement of cell phones through a city. Mm, right. We're not tracking individuals and we don't do anything in real time. But the whole idea was, you know, not unlike what a hydrologist does when they go and look at a water table and look at where, where water coming into a, wa into a, into a, uh, a water district, where it comes from, what, what the sources are, what's the quality of the water, things like this. We were looking at exactly that kind of that kind of information, and you're you're absolutely correct. So the question then becomes: All right, where do you need to use that data, and is that data worthwhile to keep 
local at the edge in order for local forecasting and projections? At what point do you consolidate it and move it into kind of the, the, the crunchy center where you do all of the, uh, the, heavy, uh, the heavy analytics and, and other aspects of reporting yeah. and, and tuning? So, yeah, and I, don't, I don't think that there is a, a single answer to that correct question, Rich, but I would say that probably in, in, in most cases, um, it's going to be, uh, uh, at least I would visualize it as being, um, you know, real-time analytics that a company would be feeding into its strategy for, um, you know, delivering new products to the city, uh, um, changing the service model it has on a given day from, from selling, um, you know, surfboard rentals to selling, um, uh, you know, umbrellas, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, that most of it be real time, but they're obviously why, why why is most of it real time? I think I think most of it could be real time because you're looking at at transient situations that would enable business opportunity in real time. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying that that's always the case, but I'm saying I think a big portion of it would be like um, a, a food truck might look at long term data for a city. But it's also going to look at real time data about yeah. okay, there's a oh, there's okay. a march in town. Oh. Where's the march? Or no, that, oh. no, absolutely. But the way you you're looking at real time data, and just and let me let me give you exactly the scenario you're talking. About. You're looking at real time data to know what the current context is and situation is. You're looking at the same data over time to provide for. Uh, planning. Right. Good example. One of the first customers we had, Streetlight, was AAA. Ooh, nice snow. Sorry, okay. um, I didn't mean to interrupt you. It's yeah, it's snowing again here, so I thought I'd give you all a live a live feed. Yeah, that's amazing. That is so hard to imagine for Austin. Yeah. That's just crazy. So AAA wanted to figure out where to place and when to place um, service trucks. Yep. Road service trucks. Yep. And they could they were looking at the data over you know some extended period of time. So they knew time, you know, what's the seasonality, what's the time of day, what day of the week, are there specific kinds of things that happen that would argue for placing a certain kind of service vehicle in a place. So um, you know, the obvious ones, all right. It's Friday night. It's a basketball game at the Oakland Coliseum. And, you know, you don't have to take a lot of full on service trucks there. You just have to have people there with, you know, batteries and 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 uh, jumper cables. Right. Right. So when it rains, things like that, this was the combination of doing the doing the overtime, the time, very the the projections and the analysis over time. And then having the real-time feeds that kind of says, I've got a situation that calls for some immediate uh, action deployment right. to someplace. So I, I think it's a balancing act. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I see it. And the reason, um, one of the reasons I brought it up, uh, and you know, uh, we don't need to belabor the point if nobody else is interested in it, is that I see this as part and parcel with my previous comment about um, being able to share resources is that imagine if, first of all, everyone that ever wanted anything to happen at the edge had to put their own stuff there, one, and two, what that would mean if, uh, you know, if, if a thousand different business models can be built on the IoT that makes a city operate a city, do we want a thousand different companies or verticals or whatever the case may be to build all that same fucking infrastructure? Makes no, no sense. Make, Makes well, no sense whatsoever. It yeah. worked so well when we had completely distinct mobile phone companies, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and, and this is I, I agree with you. I think that the the you know edge is a very sensor you know driven play. I include video and audio in those. And, and it doesn't make sense to have overlap sensor networks. I mean, we're building it with autonomous cars where they don't, they don't really get any benefit from surrounding cars or surrounding sensors. And to me, yeah, 
Yeah. Not yet, but that's going to have, that has, that's going to have to change. I, that's, you know, what we're, I think. But actually, that's, that's not true. Um, there is some of that that is already in play today and some that's literally right on the cusp. Um, okay. I mean, in some of the work that I'm doing with Qualcomm, I have some insights to this and you look at some of the platforms they're building and actually they are bringing in data from other vehicles. So your vehicle, okay. you're, you're driving your vehicle, you're actually going to be benefiting from data from other vehicles that use is ostensibly use that Qualcomm platform, yeah. but from other vehicles around you, as well as data from other sources that are not in the vehicle. And you're, you're benefiting you, in a way, the early versions of exactly that, Tim, are you, you drive down a, a freeway with sensors that is, you know, watching the traffic a quarter mile or half a mile or a mile in front of you. And that's feeding back uh, traffic signals, signage, any all sorts of all sorts of mm -hmm. feedback to the system to try and do control flow. And what right. you're talking about is making it to, to Mark's point, more and more real time, more context uh, aware and, and how you get it is now coming close to the, you know, vehicle to vehicle. So now yeah, it's coming, it's gotta come. I, I think the benefits to a system like that um, could potentially be much more radically transformative um, with a couple other things thrown on top of it, like the need to change fuel systems for vehicles more rapidly than we're doing, um, which would cause vehicle, a, a, turn, a faster turnover in, a, in vehicle owners, you know, vehicle purchasing. Um, but I, I, could, those things, those things, right? You you could have a cascading effect where, you know, having a sensor-based highway could really enable autonomous trucking in a way that was really powerful. Absolutely. Uh, I, I right? mean, to 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 give you guys an example of that that I thought was so stupid and yet so powerful at the same time hmm. was when I was working with Ericsson, I was um, consulting on an edge opportunity at a giant mine that Rogers Communications was responsible for connecting in Canada. And um, so I didn't actually ever have to go out to the mine. Uh, unfortunately, I would have liked to just because I love the big trucks and tractors and all that stuff. But um, in in working through them uh, and or working through the opportunity with Rogers and with the uh, mining representative and Ericsson, one of the pit bits of data that still sticks with me today and probably will always stick with me is that having edge at the site meant the difference on a daily basis for truck and tractor refueling hmm. of $100,000 every freaking day by having it there so that the, they could optimize a combination of when to refuel, regardless of how much fuel was actually in the vehicle at the time, they could optimize a combination of route and refueling to ensure that trucks never drove an extra three or four miles at five miles to the gallon Right. Uh, in order to go fill up hundred thousand dollars a really day fast. every day of the year yeah, and so you take that and you take you know what your example that you just talked about rob and and this you know it, it begs the question which uh, i wrote about relative to data centers um seems like a hundred years ago now um when i was still doing data center pulse and that's the idea that we we can't look at the consumption of technology from a power and energy standpoint, purely outside of what would be the alternative if we weren't using technology. So that's, that's a good point. It's, right? it's just, um, this isn't an on off, it's an A or B. That's right. If we weren't using technology, then we would have, I mean, a FedEx would have to have another 100,000 trucks in North America if we weren't using fucking technology to map their routes more efficiently. That alone probably covers all the technology that FedEx uses from an energy consumption standpoint. Mm -hmm. One thing, I'm and just we, guessing. We, and, and we're, but, and to me, and then we are want to sing for rich. Hmm. Uh, I'll, I'll make, right. I'll make the, the closing point. But what you just described is the, we are going to run systems at 80% capacity. We are going to use the tech we have to run systems at 80% capacity. Um, 
and we're going to use algorithms to make things smarter and we just have to. Yeah. Um, well, that should be the target. Yep. And too much gets run at 20% as, opposed, right. to, as right. opposed to 80. And so I, I think that that's something we need to think through in our, in our designs. Yeah. Um, not just the computer processor, but the, the oh. systems surrounding it. All of them, all of them. And, you know, what you have left over if you're not running at 80 has to be made available to things that are non-critical, for example, things that you can allow um, use, but get kind of shoved to the side when uh, you have an emergency, emergency situation or something that's critical. And so that, that means you've, you've kind of given a, uh, a scale to the, to criticality or urgency, and there's a there's a stack ranking of them that that's apparent. Wow! I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I I learned a lot. This really makes me think about what is going to motivate the market um, as we go forward, from autonomous cars to uh, disasters like what we're dealing with today in Texas, with cascading failures from the power, water supply, and um, road networks. All important. Please come in and join the conversation, the2030.cloud. Um, we love to hear new, new voices and, and get people's opinions in and ask good questions. Talk to you there.